J-Lo. Jennifer Lopez. Where does she fit in your story? Jennifer Lopez used to dance at the back of Kip's Bay. So we used to play uh, basketball um, in the front um, with like a lot of big basketball players, Ed Pickney, Billy, Billy Singleton, um, a lot of big ball players that went to like Stevenson High School. But in the back, um, Harold Maldonado ran a like um, creative whole dancing acting whole thing in the back. Mm -hmm. So you know us being young boys, what we do? We always run to the back to see all the hot girls dancing, and it would be like Jennifer Lopez, Kerry Washington, um, and in the front of the house playing baseball and basketball was like me, Lord Tariq, Big Pun, like that. So it was like just a whole diversity. Are we talking about the same scandal, Kerry Washington? Yes, Kerry Washington. Wow, wow. <laughs> Please, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage this week's Power Move maker, Mr. Sean Pekas Costner. Doing that sound. Heck. What's up, man? Heck, I'm so happy to have you in the building. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You know, and I, and I, and I really want to start off by saying thanks so much, because I called you. It right. was no, you know, ifs, ands, or buts about it. You was like, Sean, when is it? Next week, where's this at? I'm there. All right. Thank you so much. No Sean, take us back, you know, because you, first I want to challenge you on something. You're from Harlem originally. Uh, How no, do you claim no. the Bronx? My dad, my dad, um, my dad and my grandmother are from Harlem, from Esplanade. Okay. And then prior to me moving to the Bronx, I got in some trouble with I grew up in what's called Heroin Alley. It's 102nd Street and Columbus Avenue, it's Douglas Projects. So uh, I grew up there from when I was born up until I was about 12, 13, 14. Okay. Got into some trouble there. So uh, you know what happens when you get in trouble? Your parents ship you to your grandparents in a whole nother borough. So they moved me to the San area in the Bronx around that age. Okay, your dad, yeah. African American? Yeah, yeah, my dad's African American. But you claim Puerto Rican. My mother's Puerto Rican. Why, why do you identify with Puerto Rican? Because I grew up in the hood and you identify with your mother is. There you go. <laughs> you speak Spanish? <laughs> yes, we speak. You're bilingual? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yo soy de Saldulce, Puerto Rico. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, you move up to the Bronx, you're 12, 13 years old. What, what does Lil Pecos look like? Like, give me an idea of who this person is. Um, well, I was actually about 14 years old at that time. Um, mm -hmm. And I was in Catholic school, so I would, you know, take the train back and forth. Um, I was probably this same size, except I had a bunch of red hair. You know, that's when the flat tops was in. So I had like the, I had the, uh, the redhead kingpin flat top. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, he was from Brooklyn, by the way. Uh, so I'd have this redhead kingpin flat top and I moved into um, 920 Metcalf in the Bronx where my grandfather lived. Um, and I move up there and I meet a bunch of kids from the Bronx. Bronx is a, is a very tough town, it's a tough neighborhood um, because it's diversified. You know, where I grew up in Douglas, in the middle of the projects, uh, was actually a tough town too because it was sort of like on the verge of Harlem, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it was a Hun 6th Street, Hun 16th Street about that time. Um, so I guess like I knew some of the guys up there already from hanging out in Harlem by the Apollo Hunt 25th Street and going out to like the rooftop club back in the days, hanging out with Brucey e. B, who was from the Bronx. Um, so the transition wasn't that bad. The, 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 the thing that always helped me was I had a big personality and I was funny. So because I was funny, it made it a lot easier. And I was about this size since I was about 14. So when you're about this you're size about at 14, I couldn't, you know, I didn't have too many problems. Nice. <laughs> Nice. Brothers and sisters? Yes. I have one sister, Danielle, from my father's side, and I have two brothers, Michael and Joey, from my mother's side. Okay, cool. You, growing up in the Bronx, you're coming up when hip-hop is starting to become hip-hop. It's not just this underground music anymore. When did you really fall in love with hip-hop? Well, the, the weird thing is I'm, I'm old. I'm 49 years old, so I actually didn't fall in 
love with the, the music of hip hop, I was actually in the hip hop culture. So saying that, in the building that I grew up in, Douglas, was 840 Columbus Avenue. Um, it's actually where um, some of the Rocksteady crew, mm -hmm. like some of the Rocksteady crew um, was from that part of Manhattan, and then the rest of the crew was from the Bronx. Um, I forget the area, but it was a, 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 a certain part of the Bronx. But I grew up with like break dancing and graffiti and going to like windows on the world and you know, I, I only had one pair of Adidas back then because we didn't have that much money, but I put the Kiwi on the Adidas with the fat shoelaces and stuff like that, which is why I'm flat foot now. You know, I never <laughs> tied my shoes. Um, but I grew up in the hip hop culture as a whole. So that was the great thing about why I loved hip hop music so much because I was a, a not a teenager, but a preteen of the 70s. Okay. Um, there's a book called Hip Hop Culture. It's the weirdest thing. I was so mad because I see this book today and I see all my friends break dancing on linoleum, pop rocking, doing graffiti. And that was the week that my grandmother sent me to my grandfather's house. So I missed the whole book. Like, you know what I'm saying? So those were actually your real friends. Those are my everyday friends that I hung wow. out with every day. They're all over this hip hop culture book with Frosty Freeze, uh, uh, Kuriaki, Crazy Legs, all of them. And I was, uh, I was so mad. Wow. But, and that's how I grew up in that. So that's what made me love music as a whole. Got you. Um, Interestingly enough, I heard you grew up with Lord Tariq, Peter Guns. Okay, so that's when I get from Manhattan, then I get to Soundview section of the Bronx. Go ahead. So now um, I, I go from Rice High School. So I went to Rice High School in Harlem my freshman year. Okay. Uh, I was a good student, but I was, you know, I was a, a bad kid. Um, so I, I got kicked out of Rice High School. So then I get into Stevenson High School, so that's my zone school. So that's where I met like Lord Tariq, um, Money Boss Players the whole Soundview crew. Peter Guns was actually from Vice Avenue mm -hmm. on the other side yep. of the Bronx. Uh, but that's how I got cool with that whole crew. So they were actually my friends um, prior to them becoming big rappers. Lord Tariq actually was one of the biggest, nicest rappers at that time, um, which was crazy because there was a DJ named DJ Triple C. Absolutely. Remember Triple C? Absolutely. So Triple C uh, at that time was right on the verge of like being like K Capri, remember? Um, uh, do wop and all of them. He was like right there. He was doing all the big parties. He's from my neighborhood. That's how Lord Tariq used to rap. So Lord Tariq started rapping by snapping. We always used to be snapping. Like well, that was a big thing with me. I was always a funny guy. So you couldn't. That was my thing. If you want to snap, we have the whole gym mm -hmm. and we go. So Lord started like zoning, owning this craft on there. He just became one of the best. You know what I'm saying at that time. And and then that's when I started to do like internships of music when he started to get real big. Um, Oh, no, I went away to college for a little bit. Yeah, but I, I, want, I want to stop you there because okay. it, 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 it's important for me. You said you weren't the best student, correct? No, no, no. I was always smart. I never really had, I had great DNA, thank God, from my mm -hmm. mom and dad. Mm -hmm. um, if I would have applied myself a lot more, I would have did well. But uh, it, it, school was easy for me, so I didn't apply myself the way I was supposed to. Okay. You go away to college where? Uh, SUNY Cobble School. Oh, you is, went to Cobble School? Yeah, I went to Cobble School. So, so I can remember because... <laughs> You probably don't even remember this, but you got such a distinctive look. I went to Binghamton. Oh, you went to Sunday Binghamton? Yeah, yeah, I went to Binghamton, and I dropped out. Right. I wound up coming home, and I finished at Lehman. Yep. And I just remember seeing you back and forth on the yard on Lehman. Right, um, so that was the same thing. When I graduated from SUNY Cobleskill, mm -hmm. I went to Lehman. Okay. Uh, I, went to, I actually went from SUNY Cobleskill to Mars Brown mm -hmm. in Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, and then my grandfather got really sick, so I came back home and went to Lehman. That's how I got into the music industry. Got you. I wanted to bring it to Lehman because I know that that's a pivotal point in your life. Yeah. Um, because now is the awakening of how you made your way to the industry. Yeah. Um, before we fast forward too much, J-Lo. Jennifer Lopez. Where does she fit in your story? Jennifer Lopez used to dance at the back of Kips Bay. So we used to play uh, basketball um, in the front um, with like a lot of big basketball players, Ed Pickney, Billy, Billy Singleton, um, a lot of big ball players that went to like Stevenson High School. But in the back, um, Harold Maldonado ran a like um, creative whole dancing, acting whole thing in the back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, us being young boys, what we do, we always run to the back to see all the hot girls dancing. And it would be like Jennifer Lopez, Kerry Washington. Um, and in the front of the house playing baseball and basketball was like me, Lord Tariq, Big Pun. Like that, so it was like just a whole diversity. Are we talking about the same scandal, Kerry Washington? Yes, Kerry Washington. Wow. 
wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and just for anybody who doesn't know, Kips Bay is a, is a boys club up in the Bronx. Yeah, so Kips Bay is a boys and girls club up in the Bronx um, who was run in the back of the house by uh, uh, Maldonado and in the front of the house by Frank Sanchez. Frank Sanchez is the guy who is the vice president of marketing for the Boys and Girls Club of America on a national level. He's the guy when the NBA gives the check to the Boys and Girls Club, he's standing there receiving the check. Um, but he actually helped me, he changed my life. He was the one that saw a lot of potential in me from a personality standpoint and being a people person. And he actually used to take me off the corner, like literally take me off the corner from hustling for me to come play baseball and basketball at Kids Bay. So he really changed my life. Wow. You're in Lehman now. In Lehman. What's your introduction to the music industry? My introduction to the music industry was, all right, so I used to date this girl, Margie, right? She was this hot Spanish girl. <laughs> so she, <laughs> she was a journalism major. Um, she, after she graduated Lehman, she ended up getting a, her master's degree from NYU. But she was a journalism major. So she used to go on, uh, uh, so before that, I don't know if you guys know, but Uptown Records started at Lehman College. Uh, Jimmy, uh, it was uh, Andre Harrell Andre and Jimmy... I forget Jimmy's last name. Jimmy Love, Jimmy who Love, had the barbershop. So they used to have a seminar somewhat just like this at Lehman College, and it was called How to Get Into the Music Industry. They had this whole room, and you sat there, and I think they really did it because they were just trying to use it as a way to uh, recruit like singers and rappers and things of that sort. But Uptown Records actually started in the student government office of Lehman College. I don't know if a lot of people know that. Um, and they used to have seminars, and I went to the seminar. And the seminar was, they talked about how Jodeci um, laid in the front of their office, um, how a bunch of guys laid in front of the office to do internships. So I was like, internships? I could do that. Work for free? No problem. So that was sort of my idealistic way to get it. And then my girlfriend, Margie, at that time, like I said, hot Spanish girl, she started to write for this magazine called Rap Pages. Remember Absolutely. Rap Pages? Sure. Like a newspaper. Sure. So me being the jealous boyfriend, I was like, listen, when you go interview these rappers, I think I should go with you to break the <laughs> ice because I know more about rap music than you. It was just me being jealous. I didn't want to lose my hot girlfriend to a rapper. Uh, <laughs> but it worked out. <laughs> my own selfish reasons ultimately end up helping me working it out for me to get into music because I remember what Jimmy and them said about the internships and one of the first artists that we interviewed, fourth or fifth, was Dougie Fresh. Wow. So Dougie Fresh was signed to a record called G Street Records and G Street Records was an independent company that was based from London. So this guy had all the licenses into like Queen Latifah, Jungle Brothers, all the whole Native Tongues group, mm -hmm. um, and PM Dawn, Correct. Grave Diggers. So I asked the guy, like, yo, can I do an internship? And he's like, yeah, you could do the internship. And then um, I did an internship there. Stay here for one second. Mm -hmm. Did you try to get an internship anywhere else before G Street? No. That was your first place? First really? One, yeah. Wow, good for you. Because I just, it, it was, I, the, first, the first place I went to to do the interview was with, at Electra with her. Okay. When we interviewed Das Effects. Okay. Um, and she interviewed Dots Effects, but I, I sort of like took over the whole interview, but it was in a conference room, nobody was really there. The good thing about G Street, and it was a very small independent label, so when you went in and you spoke to the person who was, I guess, sort of like, um, uh, uh, sort of like who handled all the press stuff, mm -hmm. was also like the GM, and then the office manager, and you know what I mean? Because the small labels, you wore many hats, so that guy, actually did the hiring there, so I was able to talk to him and get the job. Can we take a, a, a brief pause right here? Because I think it's important for anybody who is in this room right now or watching this on video, everybody wants to go to the place that's popping. Everybody wants to go to the biggest and the baddest. But sometimes you have to put your ego in your pocket and you have to just get in the door. And similar to you at G Street, you know, when I took the internship at Bad Boy, it was in a room, it was in a, you remember the, the, the 19th Street yeah. um, building, the office was no bigger than this room. And like right. he said, the, 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 the front desk receptionist was also, the mail room clerk was also the, the HR. But yeah. getting in 
and you're wearing so many hats. You learn the business. So as a gym, I think it's important for people. Stop. It's more important for you to get in. And sometimes you have to think about the bigger picture. Right. So good for you. You get in at G Street. How long are you there? Um, so I get in the G Street. I'm probably there like a year and a half. Pay? No. At all? At all. How'd you survive? I su- um <laughs> um, there's a seven year statute of limitations right? <laughs> my lawyer Don is there don't worry about it again. <laughs> um, uh, how do I survive I mean I hustled I did everything I had to do to make money on the side it wasn't about making money my mother's best friend they used to argue and fight my man Earl God bless him he died but him and my mother used to fight Oh, I can't believe you work somewhere and you don't get paid. She's like, he's always like, oh, Marina, leave him alone. He's going to be all right. Trust me, he'll be big one day, blah, 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 blah. But it, how, I, how I survived was, so you're going to love this story. So there was a promotion guy. His name was Reg Reg. He was, after I did like all the office stuff, so I was the front, when you came into the office, I was, I was basically the front door receptionist. I was the receptionist. I handled all the office stuff and everything um, for, for the whole uh, a whole, uh, all the executives that worked there, which made me learn all the paperwork and things like that, which was cool. But the, the thing that took me to the next level was there was a guy, Reg Reg. To me, Reg Reg was the coolest guy. He was the guy going to see Funkmaster Flex at the radio station on Saturday night. He was the guy going to the tunnel to talk to Big Cap. He was the guy talking to all the big DJs around the country. And I was like, I want to be him. So once I learned what he did, and then he started going on the road to like Philly, DC, Virginia, uh, uh, and then up to like Boston and you know that whole little northeast run we used to do mm-hmm. later on I just told him I said hey listen let me do you a favor can I drive you you know you got the van I'll just drive you and if I drive you you don't have to do nothing I'll do everything else and he allowed me to drive him and when he allowed me to drive him I got to meet all the DJs on the road you know I mean I was respectful but I have a big personality but I got to meet all them guys we got to meet all the funk master flexes up and down the country mm-hmm. um, and then how I started to make my money was Jessica Rosenblum at that time had this guy, Big Cap, God bless the dead, he died, Big Cap, but he was a good friend of ours, you know that. Yeah. And what people didn't realize was Big Cap was one of the most influential figures, not a DJ, figures in hip hop to break so much music. Every, all, a lot of the music that you heard Funkmaster Flex play or DJ Enough or Hot 97 even add, it was Big Cap. Big Cap had a two hour window at the tunnel. He had to be there from 10 to 12. So Jessica, once I met Big Cap and I was driving Reg everywhere, I would take Big Cap and became sort of a pseudo manager where I would book him for parties up and down the East Coast. But she said, no problem. You got to split the money with me, one. And two, his ass got to be back at the tunnel every night at 10 o'clock for his opening set Sunday night, which was ritual. So I said, Jessica, if you let me take him one time and I get him back at 10, cool. She's like, you can do it. I said, all right. I got him back at 10. He smoked 8,000 blunts of the worst weed you ever <laughs> smelled. You remember Big Cap? Yeah. He, used to have, he had these glasses, right? They were so thick. And there was beepers back then. His shit used to be scratched up, the Chanel glasses. Uh-huh. <laughs> and they were so big, bottle caps. And he would have this beeper because Jessica would start beeping him at 8 o'clock to see where he was. And he'd be rolling that blunt, looking at the beeper. <laughs> and he just became like my best friend, you know? And... When he became my best friend, he helped me break a lot of records in that two hours span. Wow. Um, you know, I love your story so far because, number one, just going back, you, you know, you go on these interviews with your, your, your ex-girlfriend at the time, mm-hmm. but you were able to spot opportunity just listening to Andre Arell and Jimmy Love mm-hmm. over at Lehman, like, you need to get an internship, get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. So here you go on and you're able to recognize you know what, I'm here doing these interviews, I'm at a label, let me take advantage of opportunities. So that's number one. Mm. And then number two, you know, being with Reg Reg, you again, put your ego to the side. You're going on the road, I wanna meet the people who you're meeting, so let me drive you. I'm humble enough to do whatever it takes, sweep the floor, wash the dishes, whatever, I'll drive, but it puts you in a position now to be close to somebody who's hot and who's moving reg reg, but also get on the road and meet people who can help change your life in the future. So have you been always a person who have recognized opportunities and took advantage of it? I am 1,000% an opportunist. <laughs> <laughs> from G Street, where do you go? Um, so from G Street, so then I start meeting all these DJs. So then this is how everything, listen to me, whatever you do in life, and the best thing, advice I can ever tell you is 
don't burn bridges because it always comes back around. If you burn a bridge, the, 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 what's they say, the ass you kiss tomorrow will be part of the foot or whatever the crazy term is, but it'll be connected to the foot that'll be putting your ass later on. And it's true because, so what I was able to do with Cap and all these other people was, then I started to get hot, started to get hot, right? So my crew was still Lord Tariq, Peter Guns, Money Boss players, but you got to remember the tunnel wasn't a nice place. It was a club that you had Brooklyn over here, you had Queens over here, you had the Bronx over here, a little bit of Staten Island with the Wu, but it was all gangsters. You had one rapper and 30 gangsters. And every gangster wanted to be a rapper and every rapper wanted to be a gangster. But, and it was every man for themselves. And you had to know how to work that room. The good thing about me, because I was Cap's man, our crew in the Bronx was by the DJ booth, you know, and Flex was from the Bronx. So it kept, it was like, it was like being in Rikers Island, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Everybody was with their people. But the thing that my point is going back to that is that I was able to help Money Boss players, Lord Tariq, Peter Guns, break their record because I had started to already create that relationship with Cap, with Flex, and with, you know, with, with the tunnel. So, you know, when I rolled up to the tunnel because I had a relationship with Jessica because I always did what she said for a year that nobody knew, I was able to walk into the tunnel with 100 guys from the Bronx. But nobody knew why. They were like, who's this big redhead kid? He must be some real crazy killer gangster. But I wasn't. I just manipulated the situation. I mean, I had 100 crazy guys with me, but we just used that to take advantage of another opportunity, which is how the record blew. So the record blows. Lord Tariq Peter Guns blows. They get a big deal to Columbia. The guy who signed them from Boston gives me a check for a thousand dollars. After I made them about two million. Exactly. <laughs> but it's okay. I didn't know the business at that time. I didn't know. Hey, if I help you with this, let me create my own consulting company where you pay me a thousand dollars a month as opposed to just one check. But it was cool because then that helped me with my next transition. So as I'm blowing these records up, Arista Records at that time, and you know, those were when the big, the big budget days. Remember exactly. That? <laughs> big budget. So the big budget days were when the music industry um, uh, used to fly all these DJs in, right? So there was a company named Arista. So Arista was the uh, uh, major label that Sean Prez's Bad Boy Company and Pulse Bad Boy Company was an independent label. So they would create all the hype on the street and then push all their records to Arista, which would take it to the next level Correct. with radio, marketing, distribution, and things of that sort. Um, so I worked, oh, so Arista brings in 250 DJs from around the country. They paid maybe a million dollars from these guys to come, you know, Toss and Tan yep. and all these guys from Miami. They pay for all these guys to come in and they do a whole weekend. They have a basketball tournament with DJ Clue and, and Bad Boy. Remember yep, you guys absolutely. had a night and Bad Boy had a night? Another, LaFace had a night, and one night was a club night. So the thing about me is I was always big in the clubs because I was always hanging out in the street. So they had an event. So they have an event, all the DJs, are, and they're like, yo, where you at, where you at? I'm like, yo, I got these 12 inches, Lord Tariq, Peter Guns. They're like, yo, bring them down. My man owns the club, I go in the back. I, me and my man Jimbo walk in with 20 boxes of records, and we start giving them the DJs. And there's a guy named Lionel Ride now, remember Lionel? Absolutely. Who was head of black music um, for, for Arista. And he comes up to me, he's like, yo, who are you? I'm like, yo, I'm Peck. I was like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm giving out my 12 inches. He's like, yo, I paid a million dollars for the event. What makes you think you could just come in here and give your independent shit? I was like, well, nobody told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> 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 so I did that, and he gave me his card, and he said, listen, you got to leave now, but tomorrow morning, come see me, and we'll talk. And I went the next day, and I don't want to say no names, but you remember them, but he fired the two promotion guys that day. And he gave me a job. It was my first job making $75,000 a year. And wow. I had a corporate card. Wow. So that's the first big check. That was the Because I got to believe G Street wasn't really cutting checks like that. No, no, they weren't. But it was a great learning experience for me. And the thing with G Street was is that I, as time went on, I just, and I still love John Baker to this day. He's a very dear friend. But I just think we just got bigger, you know. So when you get over to um, Arista, what's your role? So my role is the I'm the hip hop promotion guy, right? So I'm the I'm the guy who deals with all the DJs around the country. I deal with the street teams. I'm gonna start dealing with the presses, me and press. Mm -hmm. That's how we established Correct. our relationship because 
you know, they, what I did was just, I was just a liaison because I understood about that level of promotion, which was guerrilla marketing, street marketing, which single-handedly changed the industry. These guys were incredible when it came to that. Um, so I would deal with presence every day, just making sure everything that bad boy was doing was, you know, uh, fickling up top and, and, and getting done the right way, right? The transitional period. Um, and, and then from there, I just worked closely with LaFace. LaFace was another company owned by L.A. Reid, yep. who ultimately later on became my boss. So I did that for a while. Um, we got really big, right? We crushed Interscope, right? Oh we used to goodness. crush Interscope, Interscope. <laughs> Interscope, you know, they had Snoop Dogg, Tupac, all of them. But those were the good years. Those man. were the good those years, the good you know years. what I'm saying? We were East Coast, New York guys, heavy and strong. They were West Coast. It wasn't, you know what? It was terrible because I watched this documentary the other day and the press made it seem like it was a beat, but it really wasn't. It was just competitive kids who were loved hip hop and just worked hard. It was like it was like repping your basketball That's team. That's what it was. It's exactly what it was, but the press made it so much more than that. Uh, but all we did was love what we do and we were just competitive. You know, you say love what you do, and I think that that's a, a, a great point real quick to elaborate on because I'm a firm believer in you have to, if you're going to excel in anything you do, you have to love it. How much would you say that contributes to your success, just really enjoying coming into work every day? Oh, man. Um, to tell you the truth, Sean, I mean, if I don't get up and love what I do every day, I just wouldn't do it anymore. Really? Yeah, absolutely. So not worth the money? It's not even about the money. You can make money doing anything. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's not about the money. The, the money's just so much better when you love what you do. You know? And I think you work harder and you don't mind putting the hours in because it just doesn't feel like work. You no, know? it doesn't. You, you know what D-Rock told me one time years ago? Hmm. D-Rock told me, he said, Peck, you got to change your mindset. I said, why, D-Rock? He goes, your name is bigger than your pockets. Wow. And I was like, Wow. When somebody tells you that, that means that you're at the point where you're doing so much for the love that you're not even thinking about making the money at that point. You know what I'm saying? You're making everybody else rich, you know, because you don't care. You're getting up, you're hustling, you're happy. A lot of people think what we do is glorified and fun, but they don't realize all the, you know, throwing 10,000 boxes in the back of a van, catching two flats before you go two blocks. You got to take them out, change it, do it all over again. There's a lot of stuff we had to do that people didn't realize. You know, we're wearing the t-shirts and hats and rocking, but they don't remember the 22 hours that we had to put in for people to have 30 minutes of fun. You know something, Sean, and I wasn't even going to go there, but I think it's so important to keep shining lights on, on, on these gems that you're dropping. You guys see Sean, he's in this suit, he, he's fresh to death always, <laughs> but if you listen to his story, it was a grind. Yeah. There, there, there's 22 hour work days for years on end throwing boxes after boxes in the beat up cars, getting on the road, not, no, no planes and trains. Mm -hmm. You're on the road driving, you know, street team vans, putting poster boards up. And I think it's important because so many people think because they look at social media and they see, you know, people's highlight reel, they think it's easy. It's work that oh, went man. into this. I wish we had social media back then. You mean I could sit in my house and just promote? We ain't got to go up in the winter time and, and drive up and down Harlem all night long. So when Puff or Jay or any one of them guys drive to work that they see all their poster boards Correct. up before the police take them down, it's crazy, man. And then, you know what it is, doing that all night, your hands are bleeding, the police come and take all the poster boards down, and your boss is calling, where's my poster boards? You ain't putting them up. You wasn't working. I said, my man, my hands are bleeding. I don't want to hear that bullshit. Go put them back up. Man, social media would have been great for us. <laughs> yeah, no, it would have been great. And people don't even understand that. And I'm going to move the interview on. But people don't understand the work that so many people who are executives now put in, putting them poster boards up. And your, your heads of companies, whether it's JD, it's uh, Puff, it's Jay-Z, you know, all these different people, they, they, they're young, they're yeah, like us. Yeah. And they want to see... Their see. product up. Yeah. And that's not to mention every artist in the game <laughs> who was essentially your boss talking about where's my boards at? Where's my promotion? Getting you in trouble. That's you right. coming into office, damn, they get fired because somebody say, I didn't see you at a club in Mount Vernon last that's right. night. That's right. That got five people in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but be it as it may, you know, you're at Arista. Yes. You meet Steve Bartles. Yes. What is Steve Bartles to you at Arista? 
Uh, Steve Bartles at Arista initially was nothing to me. Uh, Lionel right now was my boss. Steve Bartles was head of promotion overall. Um, and I mean, now he's my very good friend and mentor, mm -hmm. but I meet him because um, I'm getting records played on the radio station that Lionel's taking credit for, but Steve knows that Lionel's not doing it, but he's like, who's doing it? So I ran into him one day in the hallway. He's like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Pecos. He's like, oh, you don't want to hear getting shot out on Hot 97 all the time, right? I'm like, yes, yeah, me. He goes, oh, me and you got to talk. So it's just like Steve is the guy who changed my life. He's the guy who taught me how to take my enthusiasm, love for what I did on a street and marketing level and become a real executive in the music industry. So he, he helped me with my transitional phase. Talk about transition. You go from Arista to where? Uh, so I stay, I'm at Arista for a little bit mm -hmm. um, and then um, Arista, L.A. leaves, mm -hmm. uh, and then he goes to Def Jam with Doug Morris Universal for a year. But at that time, you know, when you start getting bigger and better, there's something called contracts. So now they're signing you and making you stay for a couple of years. So I had to go to Jive. So um, uh, uh, Jive BMG acquired Arista, mm -hmm. so I stayed there. So I spent a year and a half uh, on tour with Usher, which changed my life. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. So uh, uh, when I stopped doing the rap stuff, you know, we got into radio. I started dealing with all the program directors and the big guys around the country. Um, and then I had to do a one-year bid. I used to call it my one-year bid. So I just went on tour with Usher. Nice. You get over to Def Jam. Yep. How do you get over to Def Jam? Do they... So my one-year one contract, contract is up. One-year contract, non-compete, I'm assuming. Non-compete. So um, Jive tries to keep me there. I don't mm -hmm. want to stay. Um, so then Steve Bartles, that's my first introduction into becoming a vice president. So that's when they created Lifestyle Promotion and Marketing. So this is your first title at Def Jam? Yeah, and it was the first title created. Remember, there was never that job Correct. title mm -hmm. didn't exist. So they created a job title for me, which now is a real job title all around the world. Tell everybody, what is a VP of Lifestyle and Promotion? Uh, a, a, a vice president of Lifestyle and Promotion is just a guy who knows radio, marketing, street marketing, um, guerrilla marketing uh, on every level, meaning who can be able to deal with independence around the country. We're dealing with what we did was putting up a lot of street paraphernalia and stuff like that, poster boards and doing a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but also can deal with the DJs and also the MDs and music directors. So it was a whole thing that was created for me. Now, what you didn't mention, you worked extremely close with artists you know, just day to day at that time, no? Well, that was really what my strength was, is that I was able to have great relationships with all the artists. So like, the reason why I went on tour with Usher was because every time he was in New York, we would spend a lot of time together. By the way, ironically, it was Puff that was the first executive producer, uh, producer that made Usher who he was. Remember when yep, Usher was, absolutely. when L.A. first signed yep. Usher, he put him with Puff we and with Puff he gave him a total swag thing. So that was my strength. I was able to hang out with the artists because I was relatable. We were from the street. We, they, we protected them in ways that other executives couldn't. We made sure they were good whenever they went out. Um, we kept them cool and stuff like that. So that really helped a lot with, um, with my career. So you know, D-Rock tells you mm -hmm. your name is bigger than your pockets. Mm -hmm. um, by the time you get to Def Jam, did your pocket catch up to your name? Definitely caught up to my <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes. Okay, we won't ask what that check looked like, but I know it was big because those were the glory days. But I bring up Steve Bartles for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Steve Bartles was nothing to you in the Arista building. He ran promotions overall, but you worked for Lionel. Yep. But you never know who's watching you. It's so important for you to do a good job when you have no idea that anybody's watching. Because Steve Bartles at Arista, you had no idea that one day he would leave, go to Def Jam, become the big wig over there, remember you, bring you over, and give you that big check. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just an amazing gem for anybody and everybody who's just watching this or in this room. You work like you have a thousand people watching you if there's nobody in the room because you never know who's going to be in position one day to give you a check. Mm -hmm. At the time that you're at Def Jam, Steve Bartles, mm -hmm. L.A. Reid, mm -hmm. and they do something a little different. Mm -hmm. They bring in an artist 
to become president of the company. Mm -hmm. Who's that artist? Jay-Z. Jay-Z. It was actually Doug Morris that brought Jay-Z in to, to be the president of, of Def Jam. And it was a, a, it, the reason why was because it was a very, it was a very weird transition. You know, uh, 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 Lior, uh, Julie, and Kaiser, who ran Def Jam, and Kevin Lyles, who ran Def Jam for a very long time, and did an excellent job, were making a transition into moving over to Atlanta and Warner. Um, so the thing that Doug saw being the head of Universal at that time was he needed somebody who, who was valid not only in the street, but also had relationships with artists and, 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 and would be a magnet for artists to still want to stay there and also come when we needed to sign. And, and Jay and his crew did a wonderful job with that by, you know, ultimately us signing like Rihanna, Neo, Young Jeezy, Rick Ross, um, because Def Jam would have had lost sort of that, not necessarily that LA and Steve didn't have that cool factor, um, and I really wasn't up there at that point, but th they were just a different style of, of managers at that time because they worked with a lot of R&B, so rappers were just a little leery, but we ultimately ended up doing really well later on. Was that your first time really meeting Jay-Z, or did you know him before Def Jam? No, no, I knew Jay from the street before that, but that was the time me and Jay got close. What was like, your first impression of him as a boss? Oh, I mean, I mean, when you... Don't say the right thing. I'm not saying just, the right just thing. Just say... It's, it's fucking... He, I'm he a street guy. He comes in the building. Listen, I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Keep it 100. I'm a street guy. He's a street guy. It's like, it's like everybody else. It's Jigga Man. You're like, yo, it's Jigga Man. You know what I'm saying? It's like, Jay-Z has this aura. I don't give a shit who you are. You could be a billionaire. You could be Michael Jackson. You could be me. We all got the same... Reaction, yo, it's Jigga Man. You know, yo, I was with Jigga Man today. You know what I mean? Like, you know why he's so successful because he's the guy. When you walk up into a room, you the whole room feels him. You know, mm -hmm. and not only that, but he's such a smart businessman and just a smooth, good dude and very welcoming. You know, sometimes people probably don't think that he's welcoming because he's just very quiet and moves in silence. But he's just like, you know, he's, they call him the God MC for a reason. You were at Def Jam for how long? Uh, I probably was at Def Jam for like maybe 10 years. What are some of the, give me the top two things that you learned from Jay directly? Either being around him or things he said. Um, I, I think the, the, definitely the one thing that I, 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 I learned from J Jay initially was he's a man of his word. Loyalty means a lot. And when I say loyalty and a man of his word was when he first met me and as time went on where we toge together collectively as a team broke a bunch of acts, he was like, Peck, I want you to know something. My was like, I'm gonna empower you. And he was, I was like, yeah. And years later, he stuck by his word and he didn't have really? to, you know? And I think when you're a man of your word and you say something, then you should follow through with that. And that's, that was a big thing that stuck with me. Um, the second thing that stuck with me obviously was you gotta bet on yourself. That time so you know I worked for him for a long time but I'm doing my own thing now because it's about generational wealth so the two things I learned from him was you know being loyal and if he said he was gonna do something he did it he did empower me and that ultimately there's gonna be a time in your life where you got to work for yourself and make yourself your own money so you did it for 10 years what was your title when you left I left Def Jam as the executive vice president of, Def, of Jam, Def Jam of the whole company congratulations Thank man you. that's huge Thank you. From Def Jam, where do you go? From Def Jam, um, there's like, there's a lot of rumblings going on about what's gonna go on top with like Steve and people coming in and um, the, who was the person who was the president at that time and then left to go to the West Coast and work for another company. So that whole thing was open about the presidency. Uh, um, but then from there, I leave. Um, i never forget Jay was performing at a big Global Citizens event in in Central Park and he calls me and he's like, yo, come see me. And he's like, yo, I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to do this Rock Nation sports thing with you. And like I said, I'm gonna empower you, I'm ready. So he takes a little um, poster pad and writes a number on it. And I was like, <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I go, the hardest part was talking to Steve Bartles. And the hardest part about doing that is the best thing in the world that you could ever do is to be able to make money and do business and create a great environment with somebody who's your friend. There's nothing 
better than that feeling in the world other than you know getting married or having kids or something great like that. But it's just like that right there is a great thing. And I did that with my close friend. We broke a lot of acts together. Um, we did a lot of history together. And the hardest thing is to tell him like, now you want to leave, you know what I'm saying? And that was probably one of the hardest things for me. And he took it and he understood and he's like, yo, is this the right move? And I'm just like, yeah, you know, I just want to, like, you know how you said it wasn't fun anymore? Mm -hmm. It really wasn't fun anymore for me to go to work um, and do music. I, I really was spending a lot of times with different athletes and stuff like that who were, you know, my really good friends and talking about business. So I just felt like my passion changed from music, transitioned from music to sports. So your passion changed even before going over to Rock Nation? Yes. Really? Yeah. And now you kind of answered my next question because I remember at the time there's this vacancy for the presidency of Def Jam. Yes. Your name is in the mix at that moment. Yes. Did you ever, you know, I heard your name, I hear Irv's name, yep. you know, but it felt like you had a real shot. Did you ever consider going for the presidency? Or uh, did, you know, just the love just go for you and you're like, you know what, I need to move on? I think... In my life, probably the one of, one of the biggest disappointments was that I never had the opportunity to become the president of Def Jam. Really? Probably one of my biggest personal failures. So if you had it to do all over again? Now? Yes. No, I don't think so now. Um, because, listen, there's no success without failure. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I failed at that, it's fine. I don't, you don't want to go back to that just to say you did it. Um, and I just think, like... Def Jam is in my heart. I don't care what anybody says. This is a part of me that helped me grow. If I can do whatever I can, like I still do, I talk with a lot of the artists there, I talk with the executives, I still help them any way I can, I would do it. But to just be the president of Def Jam um, right now, probably not. Really? Mm -hmm. You go over to Rock, um, to Rock Nation. At the time that you're still at Def Jam, Jay is there, did you know that they were planning on creating a uh, uh, sports company, a sports... Uh, Where, at, at Rock? At Rock Nation. It was already established. It was already established. Yeah, yeah, they already they had to wait until they build it up to a certain level for me to come over. You know, they had to... Got you. Yeah. So when you get the number, yes, this looks good, mm -hmm. you go over there, what's your title? Uh, my title is Vice President of Player Relations. Okay, what does that mean? That means that um, my job was to just deal with the recruiting process of other players, help with the day-to-day -day management staff, um, by them plugging into my Rolodex and me helping them making sure like the players ate at the right restaurants, dealt with the right jewelers, didn't get jerked with, you know, different stuff, teaching them how to do simple things like securing themselves when it came to uncompromising sure, situations. I, I usually don't cut people off, but people pay people to make sure that somebody eats at the right restaurant mm -hmm. and goes to the right jeweler. Yeah. You got paid for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I need that job. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot more than that, but I'm just saying what people always looked at me was, was plugging into my Rolodex. Look, you couldn't, some people can't get in Carbone. Some people can't get into pools. Some people can't get into rails. Some people can't get into, you know, um, Jimmy's Bronx Cafe in the mm -hmm, Bronx. Mm -hmm. But you always want to make sure that your clients are safe. That's where we came from learning the music industry. We always want to make sure our clients were good and safe. But yes, you know, we always help with brand development deals and things of that sort. But that's, those are team things that you work with. You know, day-to-day -day things are what companies need to do. Because if you take a vested interest in a young kid who doesn't know how to move around and has been catered to his whole life and then just sign him to a basketball team, give him $20 million and then throw him to the wolves, you're not doing your job. One. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's not a job. Your job is supposed to take this kid, help him mature, make sure he's safe. You know, at, at 17, he's still a cub, bro. You're not a tiger or a lion yet. And you still got to help him make sure he's not getting jerked or, you know, or girls putting stuff in his drink to, you know, knock mm -hmm. him out and steal his watch, his Rolex, his chain. Then he gets $200,000 <clears> worth of jewelry stolen. He don't got no insurance to cover it. And, you know, he's looking crazy. He's looking like a mark. Like, there's a natural, a naturate, is that the correct pronunciation? Natural progression and well, natural uh, maturation. Maturation? Uh, like, you know, um, uh, there's a... Prog uh, what I'm trying to say, a maturity part, like there's a maturation, maturation. I'm sorry. There's a maturation part of a person's life that you have to walk them through to make sure that they get to where they need to be to help them grow. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think that the one thing that I loved about Rock is that that's what, when I was at Rock, that was the thing that was important to them. 
Whenever they took a kid, they made sure that the maturation process was good, that you go from being signed, being, learning how to be a man, then getting your money, and then being a big, bigger brand. Like, it was all about brand development from the beginning. So that's one of the things that I did, and we learned that from music. You know, your, your, your life is taking you on this wild ride. Um, you, you, you're dealing with artists, now you're dealing with athletes. Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer the athletes or the artists? Um, it's both the same uh, babysitting process. <laughs> 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 um, no, I love both. To tell you the truth, the reason why I love both is because I, I love brand development. I don't care what it is, but I know if I'm part of a team that help a kid go from being one of the best basketball players in his college or hometown and become a superstar in a couple of years, I love that. You know how it is. If we take a record from the A&R guy and then we start to develop it on the street and then on radio and then now on streaming and you see him blossom and you hear his music and see now when he walks up into a club or into an arena, people are going crazy. That's a process of, that took a lot of work from a lot of different people. That makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I know that I was part of a team that helped that guy become a big star, which is why now we still can talk to these guys because they don't forget. They knew what, what we went through to help them become these big superstars, you know? Um, the difference, though, is every night an athlete has to get on the field or on the basketball court and produce. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Correct. A guy could sit in a conference room and tell you he's hot in Memphis, Tennessee, and you could be like, that's not true, bro. But you know what I'm saying? He, he can build it up, but every day athletes have to go to work. Who are some of the athletes that you worked hand in hand with at Rock? I know you know a million athletes, but who, you know, because I always see you with CeCe. You know, mm -hmm. that seems to be one of your close friends, confidants, brothers. Mm -hmm. um, was CC your main client there, or did you have others? No, no, no. We, we deal with all the clients there. CC and I was just close because he was one of the guys that I was friends with before I got into sports. Mm -hmm. He was one of the guys who was influential in, for me to come to Rock to work really? with. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How so? Um, he was just like, yo... All the stuff you do over there, you can just come help and learn and do over here with us, you know? He was one of the, the big cheerleaders, you know? Mellow too, but Mellow, even though Mellow wasn't signed to rock, Mellow and Jay always had a great relationship and he was, he was influential too. Got you. Because athletes live on the road, how much time did you spend on the road? Um, at that point, it's not really a lot because our company has managers and stuff like that. It's not really that day-to-day -day stuff, you only went to like either big events, you know what I'm saying? Like okay. things like when CC achieved his 3,000 strikeout, you wanted to be there to support him, um, when he won his 250th game, or if there was like big things, or if we had to put events together for them, sort of like philanthropy events or things like that, the different teams would go out. Um, but with me, I traveled a lot because I, it was so many different players I would want to go see. It was like, you know, when your artist first started the concert tours, you went out on the first day of the tour to support. So it, it was always either like monumental stuff. Quick question for you. Mm -hmm. Working with athletes, what's the best part of the job? Um, going to the games free. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think the best part of the job is like, listen, like I said, I'm passionate about sports. So, you know, you get to spend these historic moments with somebody who you work for. At the same time, that gratification is, come on, man, like, you know, uh, I mean, you know, they don't see a lot of the stuff that goes on behind it. And it's just not one person. Don't, if anybody tells you it's just one person that's doing that, that's a 1,000% team effort. It's a team. Yeah, yeah. What's the worst part of the job? Um, I think the worst part of the job is sometimes when you travel a lot and you give so much, you miss some of the most important things when it comes to, like, your family or kids. Um, I think, like, that's the worst part of the job that sometimes, you know, you have to damn like, damn, if, if I'm there for work, but then... I might have missed my daughter's first tennis game or, or her first basketball game or swim meet or, you know, something like that. So I, to me, that, that would hurt me the most. You know, I, I, I got a question, and you're the perfect person to ask this because you balance the streets and the suites so well. Uh. Coming from where you come from, do you get a lot of pressure from the old crew? Or do they embrace you for becoming the man that you've become? My old crew, meaning the guys I grew up with? The guys you grew up with? No, I don't get no pressure at all from them. Really? Zero. Because um, they're my same friends for 30 years, and I make time for them. I make time for my friends that I spent growing up with because they were there for me when I didn't have nothing. 
and God forbid tomorrow I don't have nothing. They love me for me. They make fun of me. Like, Pecos, get out of here. We know Sean, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They always make fun of me, but they make fun of me because there's true love within them, you know? Um, and they've always been supportive. I've been supportive of them. You know, if anybody knows me, you could come to the Bronx. I'm on East Tremont I'm smoking a cigarette, I mean, a cigar, uh, or I'm hanging out in a local restaurant in the Bronx somewhere. Um, you know, I, I I'm, I'm a Bronx guy, and I love the Bronx. You know, I sit on the Bronx Children's Museum board and things like that, but I'm at Yankee games. I'm at my cousin's local bar by the Yankee games. Anybody can see me on any given day in the Bronx, and it bugs people out sometimes, but it's who I am. Man, I mean, it, it, it's so dope that you said you got those same friends from 30 years same ago. Same friends. Nice, nice. Quick couple of questions for you. Hip-hop versus sports, which one do you prefer? They're both the same. If you had the choice to be in one industry, which one are you going? Music or sports? I, I, I'm gonna, they're both the same. <laughs> <laughs> to you they are, but to them, <laughs> they're not. To people who are watching this on YouTube or wherever they're watching it, it's not. What's the key though? What do you what's, mean what's the key? What's relationships. the key word? No, what's the key word you just said? Love? No, what? you're watching. Okay. You watch sports, you watch hip hop, you watch music, you watch videos, you watch concerts, all the same thing. You know the biggest thing, rappers want to be athletes, athletes want to be rappers. It's the same exact thing, it's just two different platforms. There's nothing really different, it's a big money business, um, you know, it's a, it's a business that on both sides, our generation and our culture demand and take over from a, a, a big perspective. Uh, and it's all entertainment. It all falls under entertainment. It's the same thing. So for you, it's the same thing. To, for me, I swear, music and sports are the same thing. I don't look at them at, in any different realm. There's big ball players, small ones. There's big rappers, small ones. There's big entertainers, small ones. To me, it's the same thing in my eyes. Okay. Another question. Yeah. What's more important, hard work or relationships? Um, relationships are way more important. Really? 1,000%. Then hard work? Yeah. Yeah. Explain. And then I got to, I, I, I like to comment on that. Okay, so you either work hard or you don't. Relationships. You can't break a relationship. You can't make it hard or soft. It's either a relationship. Without relationships, work is going to be 100 times harder than it would be. You understand what I'm saying? It's not about working hard. Work smart. People work smart. You're going to only work as hard as you want to, but if you work smart, you ain't got to work that hard. Work should be fun. Nobody should have to get up every day and do something that they don't love to do. I think that that's so important because people think that they can't have a job or they can't have a career that they love. And because of that, they just take what's available to them or they take what they see themselves being qualified for. I'm 100% agree with you. I absolutely think you should work in an industry that you love. But going back to this hard work versus relationships, can you acquire the relationships without the hard work? Would anybody be, would anybody care about Sean Pecos if you did not put that hard work in to build those relationships? Well, I mean, you gotta start somewhere, obviously, you know? But I just think, like, listen, at the end of the day, if I bust my ass working hard, right, and I treat somebody bad, it doesn't matter how hard I work because I just messed up a relationship. You don't know if this guy's going to be the head of the company a year, two years from now, but I'm busting my ass. But I, because he's under me, I treat him bad. What happens when he leapfrogs over you and he's the boss? You just burnt the bridge, a relationship. Don't matter. Got to work. That's why I'm saying the difference between work and smart. That's why I treat everybody the same. You know that? I don't, I, I can never be too big not to do anything that I feel like I'm available to do because I have a relationship. You call me one time, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I'm here. You, you know, your, your, um, your award show that you do when you call me like, Peck, I need you to put a jacket on and give Kick Capri <laughs> this lifetime achievement award. I'm like, I'm there. Yeah, correct. You know what I'm saying? This is a relationship and a friendship, but I would never break that. If I can't do it, I just can't do it. You know what I'm saying? But if I can do it, I'm there. Who's your favorite artist and favorite athlete that, to work with? Um, and why? My, 
I, I guess, honestly, my favorite athlete that I've ever worked with was has to be CeCe. Okay. Uh, one, I'm a huge baseball fan. I'm a Yankee fan. And we and just... Puerto Rican. And the Puerto Rican. He's not <laughs> Puerto Rican, though. But Puerto Ricans love baseball. Oh. Like, that is y'all <laughs> sport. Yo, that's not right, man. <laughs> 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 um, but I love baseball. I love CeCe. And that's just think he helped me grow. He was my favorite one to, to, to work with. Um, and then I don't... Uh, I think my favorite artist... I can't say Jay because I worked for Jay, so I, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I think probably one of my favorite guys, there, there's a lot, there's too many um, to say. There's too many because, you know, like, I, I mean, it's too many for me to say. Okay, fair enough. Um, not putting you on the spot, and you can say I pass on this. Who's your not so favorite artist or athlete to work with? Um, that's not, that, I mean, I, I love everybody. That's, okay. I don't really like. I don't really have anyone that I worked with that I hated to work with. Um, and it's fine. Like, if you don't have one and you don't want to say, it's fine. No, I, I honestly really don't. I really don't. Okay. Yep. I got a couple. <laughs> 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 um, Jay told you a while ago, early in your career, bet on yourself. Yep. Tell me about your entrepreneurial endeavors. Mm -hmm. I know you went into the restaurant and in, in, into the restaurant business. Yep, I went to the restaurant business. I owned a restaurant with some friends of mine um, in Queens. It was called S Prime Steakhouse. They owned a place called Studio Square, which was like a big event space, and I helped them uh, develop that. Um, I always want to own my own restaurant. That's like the first thing some people want to do when you watch the old gangster Italian movies. You want to have your own spot to hang your hat, you know what I mean? Your own table with your name on it. So I did that. Um, it was great. It was a great restaurant. People still to this day um, ask me about it. But my partners got up and, and, and moved their business to Naples, Florida. So it was too far for me. Um, so you want to talk about what I'm doing now? No. Let me go back. Were you ever involved in Truffle? Yeah, yeah, I was on a, a part owner of Truffle. You were part owner of Truffle yep. as well. Yep. So, so you were in the restaurant yes. business? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, let's walk us to, in, in really just stand on this whole entrepreneurial um, insight that we're talking about. WFLA. Yep. What is it? Explain. And what's your role? Uh, the WFLA is a Women's Football League okay. Association. Um, so I go to a dinner not too long ago uh, with my man Don, who, who works for um, one of the uh, lawyers' offices where one of my lawyers uh, is a partner. Uh, and I meet them after we, you know, we discuss certain uh, business endeavors that we did and they handled for me. Um, and they meet a woman named Lupe Rose, who's from California. She owns an acquisitions company. Probably one of the smartest women I've ever met. So, you know, Acquisitions is a company who buys smaller companies, raise them up, and then sells them for more money. So one of the um, companies that she acquired was the WFLA. Um, so I go to dinner with them. We talk. Um, ja Rule's there. Um, ja Rule is actually one of the owners of the New York team, the New York Stars. Okay. Um, um, and the reason why I love the whole Ja Rule thing is because, listen, like I said earlier, without success, you can't have failure. For him to do the whole fire thing yep. and it from an uh, organizational standpoint didn't work. But he's not the only one. There's a million billionaires that had businesses like that that didn't work. That the first or second ones were a whole wrecking thing because of the operations weren't there, things of that sort. But listen, without big ideas, none of this shit would be around. You know what I mean? So I meet with Lupe and Don and and, and, uh, and another lawyer of mine, Steven, and she sits and she talks to me, man, this woman, she sucked me in. I ain't gonna lie, like, I, I haven't been impressed by somebody like that in a long time. Um, and I just think, after I met her, you know, I have three daughters, and I would never wanna tell my three daughters that there's nothing in the world that they can't do. Like, you can become president of the United States, but you can't play professional football if you wanted to. Correct. Um, and she, sold it to me like Peck, like you got to understand like right now is a time for women's empowerment you know what i mean and now for women a woman to be able to do whatever she wants make real money play for, for a professional team it's not like the lingerie league or anything like we're not knocking that i'm just saying this full contact football you know there's 32 teams 55 players on each team you know we have combines um we have teams all around the country um and teams are selling you know every day as we speak but it's like it gave me the opportunity to tell my daughters they can do whatever they want to do. 
Um, and then outside of the fact that she made me, gave me a, an opportunity I couldn't turn down. <laughs> <laughs> From an owner's perspective and being a partner and, and learning real business as we were going along. She's the first person that gave me an opportunity to not only do a job, but also have an ownership in it and teach me about the background business of it. All in one shot. Like I learned more from her maybe two weeks than I learned maybe in two or three years of my career from a business standpoint. You know really? what I'm saying? I'm talking about back of the house numbers and a bunch of different shit. And that's the reason why I did it, because I believed in it. You know? Look, the WNBA has been around for 25 years, right? Uh, women's soccer is huge right now. Women are boxing. The UFC has women. You know, Ronda Rousey's probably one of the biggest stars in the world right now. So what makes you think in 2021, when we start our league, that you won't find 10 or 15 or 20 superstar women on that football field, you know? So listen, you, you won't be able to make generate, create generational wealth if you don't take chances on some things. This one, I feel in my gut. So because I acquired so much, I'm be, I became the president of the WFLA. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Hello, give <laughs> Congratulations. How many teams on the WFLA right now? There's 32 total teams. Really? Yes, but not all of them are sold. Right now we have approximately like 19, 20, but there's 32 overall. So the league launches in 2021? Yes, we'll have some exhibition games um, at the beginning of next year, 2020. Um, both, like, there'll be like five on the West Coast and five on the East Coast to start to generate a lot more stuff. Um, there's a whole thing though. There's like AEG, um, who we're doing business with as far as like the stadiums. Um, there's also beverage aspect and things of that sort from a business standpoint with the teams. There's a, there's a lot. And I have, if anybody wants the information on it, I can send it to you guys. That's amazing, man. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. We're going to wind it down. I'm going to ask you some questions that I ask every guest. Mm -hmm. What's the best advice you ever got? The best advice I ever got probably was to bet on yourself. It's the best advice. Jay-Z. Bet, bet on yourself. It's the worst advice you ever got. Uh, worst advice I ever got was... Don't go to Puff Daddy's uh, birthday party. Remember, it was like his 30th or something like that. It was a lady I used to work with, and she got jealous that she didn't get invited, and I got invited to, it was at Cipriani's. Remember the yes, Cipriani's? Yes, I do, 30th birthday. Yeah, I spent my last money on a suit, and she was like, I don't think you should go. It wouldn't look right that you got invited, and, and all the uh, other executives didn't. So I didn't go. Um, you didn't go to Cipriani's party? No, nah, I didn't go. Sure. I went, I know, I know, I played myself. Um, I, I thought I was going to lose my job at Arista the next day, but it didn't matter. I ultimately ended up hiring a lady years later uh, for some stuff. I don't mean it in a bad way. It's just like, listen, if a person doesn't get, doesn't get treated or invited to something that you are and they feel like they're your elder in any position, like, go with your heart. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you feel like, the one thing about Puff, he threw parties and they were places where people could just do, like, networking, like, where you couldn't believe. Um, and I regretted not going, but you know, I respect people. So she was my elder from a position standpoint at that, at that time. And she said it wouldn't be good for me, but that was the worst advice I ever got. You one of the first people I ever interviewed that actually could answer that question. Like everybody's like, I got to think about this and get back to you. <laughs> that was some real bad advice that stuck with you. Terrible. You, you went <laughs> off the top like, yes, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> What advice would you give to your younger self? 21-year-old Sean Peckers. I would tell 21-year-old Sean Peckers, I wish I would have done more equity style. Like, I would have been my own boss at 21. Really? Yeah, just because I had so much to offer, my personality, my ability to talk with people and create relationships, I would have done more for generational wealth for myself. You keep using that word, generational wealth, and I think we're on the same page with that. What does that mean to you? Um, that means that that gives my daughter's kids the opportunity to have monetary opportunities that I didn't have. I'm not saying I want them to each have a check for $20 million when they reach 18. I just want them to be able to have the ability to, to touch things that I was never able to touch, you know? Like, I, me and my father laugh. He, we always joke around and say, oh, when I was younger, you know, I used to have them big diamond chains. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, nigga, you should have bought some buildings instead of them there diamond chains. There you go. Chains. So I just wish, like, I, I was able to have had that for myself, 
but I want to work on giving that to my kids. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like when I leave, I want them to have stuff that they have to continue to work hard to make grow and get bigger. Nice. Last question for you. You've had one hell of a ride. At what point did you sit back? And we all have these points in our career where you look and maybe you're in a room, maybe you're sitting at a table, but at what point did you sit back and say, damn, I did it, like, like I arrived. When, when was that aha moment for you? I, I still haven't achieved that moment. Really? Yeah. Still? Still. All of the artists, all of the celebrities, all of the parties, you still don't feel I arrived? Nope. I still do not feel like I have arrived. Why is that? Because I haven't fully achieved what I want to achieve yet. And when I do, I arrived when I'm laying in my coffin dead and I work my ass off. That's when I arrive. I will arrive to heaven. You know, I think that that is a, a trait of so many driven people. No matter what goal you achieve, it always feels like I have a little bit more to go. Mm -hmm. It never ends. The marathon never ends. Everybody, please give it up for this week's Power Move Makeup, Mr. Sean Pepper. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.